Um, all right, so uh, you can read all this later on, but I've been in the business since 1979. That's also when I became a member of NSPI, uh, which is the forerunner to ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement. So I've been doing this for a lot. I've been involved with the society for a long time. Central to my approach to instructional systems design, my favorite term for what is sometimes called ID, instructional design, or nowadays learning experience design, um, and to my performance improvement methodologies is this notion that performance competence, I borrowed the term uh, competence from uh, one of my indirect mentors over the years, the late Tom Gilbert uh, and his book, Human Competence. But uh, so I borrowed that it could have been called performance capability um, and other terms, but I use performance competence, which to me is the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. And when we meet stakeholder requirements, we're producing worthy outputs, another phrase from Tom Gilbert's book, Human Competence. Uh, and this exists at the worker level or people level, a bit different names for these things, the work or workflow or processes level. So we can have performance competence at the worker level, at the workflow or processes level. We can have it at the workplace or organizational level. And uh, we can have this at the world or societal level. Now, the four W's is something that Roger Addison created, and uh, it kind of reflects uh, our view that we should be looking beyond individual performance. We need to look broader. And uh, to honor uh, the late Roger Kaufman, who gave us the term mega, you know, there's micro, there's macro, there's mega, which is looking at the, our, the impact that we have to society as a whole. Now, I use a lot of old school language because I've been writing and presenting and talking about this kind of stuff since the 80s. So my uh, advice to you is to adopt what you can, but adapt all the rest, and especially probably most of my language. It's a little bit old school, if you will. Um, we're gonna do this in three parts. I'm gonna give you a little background foundation uh, to, sh to share with you where I'm coming from about all of this. Uh, then we're going to talk about performance and gap and enabler data. My slide here is missing a word. Uh, and then how I structure the performance improvement effort. And we're going to stop three times for questions and answers after I've done each one of these sections. And I'm not going to be looking at the chat screen. So Kristen is going to look at that, field all the questions, then feed them to me when we get to the appropriate stopping point. Now I have a process performance orientation. It goes back to my first days in the business. I happened to join a, a department and I became the 10th person in this department. Two of the people there had worked with Gary Rumler's brother at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Detroit. I was up in Saginaw, Michigan. And one of the people in the department was Gary Rumler's brother-in-law. So I was given this performance orientation a la Rumler and his business partner previous to the, the late 70s, Tom Gilbert. And both of them are kind of famous in the ISPI, NSPI circles. So I have this performance orientation and I think it's important to see outputs as inputs downstream. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But the problem that all of us have in doing this kind of work and taking a performance orientation or a process orientation is that most processes or what's nowadays called workflows are informal, they're unnamed, they're unmeasured, they're unmanaged. And yet we've got to figure those things out so that we can uh, help people perform in those processes and produce worthy outputs that meet stakeholder requirements. So my little diagram here is the ovals there are output slash input. So every process generates an output, which if you think about it, is an input downstream or elsewhere. It could be going to many different places. The worth is determined by the stakeholders. So I saw a model of this in 1981. This is from Rumler, Gary Rumler and Dale Brethauer. And this model goes back to the 60s. Now this particular version here was given to me by Gary for a quarterly newsletter that I was doing in the late 90s or early 2000s, I forget exactly which. And notice the left to right orientation. Now the numbers are going a little bit backwards on that, but if you go to the far right there, there's inputs, and then there's a processing system where tasks and steps or steps and tasks happen, where overt behavior happens, uh, physical behavior or whatever language you wanna use, or 
cognitive behaviors, thinking, things that we can't see, we can't count, but that's happening. That's all part of that processing system. And that all produces an output that goes to a receiving system. And the receiving system is kind of a, a unique spin that uh, Rumler and Brethauer put on this and going way back into the 1960s at the University of Michigan. Um, but anyway, so the receiving system is the downstream customer, if you will. And after I published this in my quarterly newsletter, Gary said to me, I, he had screwed up because he had left something off of this picture here. And it is the consequences, which is a type of feedback, but it's a very specific type of feedback. There are consequences such as, we don't like your outputs, we're stopping ordering from you so you don't have our business anymore or things like that, or just you know, uh, corrective uh, feedback uh, um, or whatever the, whatever the consequences may be. And that's kind of funny when he told me that because back in 1981, I had joined Motorola and I came in a week early so that I could hear this guy, Gary Rumler. I knew all about Gary Rumler then because I had worked in the department and they were all Rumlerites. And Gary Rumler was coming in to speak at Motorola. And so I came in a week early to attend the one day workshop. And this has been recorded. And so there's a video of this and you can hear him say on there that he had forgotten to put consequences on one of his slides then too. So uh, I guess it had gone into his non-conscious uh, repertoire and uh, he was, uh, he knows it, he just couldn't put it down on the slide. Um, so this was important. On my first day in the training world back in August of 1979, I was given Tom Gilbert's book, Human Competence, which had just come out a year earlier. And there's this thing called the behavior engineering model in ISPI, NSPI circles. This is a big deal and everybody knows about this. Now, this has been updated a couple of times. Donald Bullock did it in the 80s and Roger Chevalier did it after that and Carl Binder has done it as well. And Carl calls his version of this the six boxes, because as you can see there, there are six boxes here. And it's all part of what Carl nowadays calls the performance thinking network. But anyway, so this has been central to a lot of us who do this kind of work, whether we're doing performance improvement beyond instruction or just instruction, we're always trying to look and see, well, what are the knowledge and skill uh, implications of the process and what it demands and what else needs to be there in the process. Because if we've been brought in to uh, deal with a problem or perceived problem and the client has perceived that training or instruction or learning is part of the solution or is the solution, we need to help them find out when that's not going to happen so that we can add value and maybe instruction is part of the solution set or not. But this is an ISPI classic, this chart. On the page before is my favorite part of this, which is the, the uh, behavior model or the engineering for incompetence. And so when I would show my clients, I would go to clients and go to prospective clients and bring along Gilbert's book. And so we could say, hey, this is what we're all about. We, we do this kind of stuff. This is how we think about the world here. This is what we're gonna bring to your effort. Um, and I would show them this particular chart and they would get a hoot out of it because they'd look at things like up there in that data column top left there, don't let people know how well they're performing, don't give people mis or give people misleading information, hide from people what's expected from them, and they would all laugh and go, yeah, that's what we do. So that was on the page before the behavior engineering model, which was a good setup for, okay, now let's look at what we should be doing, and we would go into the behavior engineering model. But this is kind of central. So this is how I learned to think about looking at performance and the performance context from an instructional systems design perspective, and later on looking beyond instruction. After I spent 18 months at Saginaw, Michigan, uh, working with these Rumlerite people, I got a chance to go to work for Motorola. And I saw this Ishikawa diagram, also known as the cause and effect diagram, the 4M model, the fishbone diagram. And this was very enlightening to me. I went, aha, this is where human performance fits into some bigger picture. So this gave me a model, a framework in which to think about things. Um, and Ish the Ishikawa diagram, Ishikawa was a professor in Japan and this model came out in the 1950s. So it was part of Japan's effort to improve the quality of their products and services post-World War II. Now, so I've kind of adapted this here, and uh, this is my version, my, what I call the epi fishbone diagram. And notice the orientation has been changed from left to right to from upstream to downstream. 
So I've got processes flowing from upstream to downstream there on the left. And I've got a whole bunch of human asset enablers and environmental asset enablers, things that enable the process. And so that's my adaptation. And for those of you who know uh, Darlene Van Team, uh, she's been involved in ISPI for a long time. But anyway, she first saw this model and she said, oh, this is a very interesting take on the behavior engineering model guy. And I said, no, it's not that at all. It's, it's the Ishikawa diagram that I've adapted. But that got me thinking that probably I had, without really thinking about it consciously, I had really folded in aspects of the behavior engineering model into this, into this model here. So, uh, but anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, so this was my mashup of both things. And I will acknowledge that Gilbert's behavior engineering model was probably part of that. But I really started off thinking I was going to expand those four M's in the Ishikawa diagram into something that was much more familiar and useful to me. And so that's where this came from. Now, and when I went to Motorola, I got a chance to work with Gary Rumler. He was my consultant on a whole bunch of projects in the brand new corporate training organization that had been established. And because he was my consultant working on my projects, really what that meant is I carried his pencils around as we went from my client to my next client. And uh, I learned from him and uh, had a chance to work on a, a dozen or so projects with him. And it was really kind of exciting. But, the, but what I learned from him was the first look at the process itself. Is there one? Is there one and is it adhered to? And if not, why not? And is actually designed to meet the requirements. I mean, if the process was followed uh, uh, explicitly to the letter, you know, is that gonna meet the requirements by producing worthy outputs? And yes or no is the answer. So I always start with the process and try to understand the process. And a lot of times when we're doing analysis, my clients would say to me, do you mean the Tuesday process or the Wednesday process? Because we do it differently every day around here, guy, which just tells you that there's really no standard process or there is one, but nobody's adhering to it. And perhaps that's the root cause of the problems. But again, we wanna look further and, and really understand that we understand what all the potential issues might be, uh, issues being the flip side of opportunities if you will, two sides of the same coin. But uh, so we want to look at the process and we want to understand, you know, is there one and if not, why not? This, the, what I also learned from Romler is that second, don't look at the human, look at the environment. And so this is my framework for looking at the environment, but what he would have us look at were the consequences. Are the consequences driving the wrong kinds of behaviors? Now, remember, consequences were a big deal to him. He had missed it in the slide that I talked about uh, back in 1981 that was captured on video. It was, he, it was missing from the graphic he had sent me to use in this article that uh, he allowed me to publish in my newsletter. But uh, so I see the culture and the consequences as being two things that are kind of bundled together. But that's just my view. Again, adapt what you need to. Um, but so I look to see our, what's involved in the environment and is it adequate to the needs of the processes, and that's the key thing. Are the environmental enablers adequate to the needs of the process? I mean, do they do, do the people that need sharp saws have sharp saws, to borrow something from Covey? Um, so either they do or they don't. Either we have things that are adequate to the needs, uh, maybe they're not perfect, but they will meet the needs of the process. And that's how I look at this. So the third thing I look at is the various things that the human brings to the process party and the environment and that context. They bring awareness, knowledge, and skills, depending on their prior knowledge. Maybe they just need to be aware of certain things, made aware of new things, and then they can perform. Or we need to go deeper into knowledge, or we need to give them an actual skill that they didn't have before. But there's other uh, attributes and values that are at play too. Do I have the physical stamina to, to do the work? If I'm a sonar man in the Navy, or whatever the job is called nowadays, um, do I have the uh, hearing that's good enough to do that kind of work? Um, do I have the psych psychological attributes needed? If I'm a salesperson and on average, you make 27 calls before you make a sale, can I deal with that psychologically? Can I handle all that rejection after rejection after rejection before I make a sale? Or do I get burned out by the whole experience and I'm not really fit for that kind of a job? I'm that round peg in a square hole or vice versa. And do I have the intellectual attributes necessary? Am I just a concrete thinker and I, and I can't be a conceptual thinker? I, I can do tactical planning maybe, but I can't do strategic planning. Well, what does the process call for? 
What's needed here? Do we need somebody that can do both? Do we need a, you know, in baseball terms, do we need a switch hitter can swing from both sides of the plate? So do we, are we selecting the kinds of people that we need? And do we have people with the right personal values? I mean, if I'm a racist or a sexist and you wanna put me in a job dealing with people in, on the international scene, I might not be a good fit. And you know, we can try to train all that away, but I was taught a long time ago not to do that. We should actually go back to the recruiting and selection system and fix things there. Bring people in in the first place that are more conducive to what the process demands are. And we can give people awareness, knowledge, and skills much easier than we can, than we can change these attributes and values. We can try, and maybe we should, and maybe the marketplace conditions are such that you know, we have to take what, what we can and we have to deal with whatever the gaps are from the rest. But so that's this model here that I use. Now, this is a favorite, favorite quote of mine, a famous quote from the, the late Gary Rumler. You put a good performer against a bad system and the system wins every time. And for the purists out there, he's been quoted on this with in varied language about this. So it doesn't always read this, but this is what came out of August 1983 training magazine, this was the quote. So sometimes it's the system wins almost every time. So there's variations on this. Um, but, but I think this is kind of central to looking, are we taking performers and putting them into a bad system where it's the system that's inadequate, the process is inadequate, the environmental enablers are inadequate and not to look at the performers themselves initially and so that's kind of my bias too. Um, I, I need to look at that, but that's not the first thing where I try to pin the blame. Now, many others have said these kinds of things in the past. Uh, w. Edwards Deming, the famous quality guru, he said that 94% of the problems lie within the system and the system is in control of management. So 94% of the problems, Deming, a famous statistician, um, said that it's, you know, it's not the people. So quit beating up on the people, go look at the system and, and try to make the fixes there. Mager, late Bob Mager has said those kinds of things. Harold Stolovich has said those kinds of things. The late Roger Chevalier has said those kinds of things. And for those of you from Boise State and know Brett Christensen, he and I wrote an article back in 2012 about chasing down these elusive credits and for facts and fictions in learning and improvement. And if there's any errors in that uh, article, those are probably attributable to me, not Brett. Um, but so this is kind of a common theme here. And oftentimes we are asked to do instructional systems design, instructional design, learning experience design, and we're not gonna be actually solving the root problems. Time for your questions and I may have answers. Kristen, do we have any questions? Actually, Michael says task analysis where fits. M Michael, you want to come off mute for a second and ask? But just otherwise, uh, folks have been saying um, hire for attitude, train for skill. Um, so just some, some comments. But Michael, if you want to come off mute to clarify your question, that would be awesome. Well, if it's about task analysis, I'm going to get into that next because that's about the data and uh, what data we get. So I'll be talking about task analysis uh, within a larger context. But this is the background. So this is this is kind of where I'm coming from. Um, you may be coming from a similar place and similar influences or from some different ones. But if it's OK, I'm just going to move on. Yep, go ahead. Oh, uh, Michael clarified and just said, it sounds like we're talking about task analysis, but with different words. Uh, Max actually said, why have you selected your version uh, of the model versus a different one? So, um, Well, I don't know enough about that. I've, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen these models and I've created ones so that I can explain things to my clients. I've been a consultant since 1982. Um, and so some models didn't fit the kind of language that I wanted to use, et cetera. So, you know, m many of us have done this, but I, um, 
So mine, I think, as a merger of a lot of things from mostly from Rumler, uh, some things from Harless and, and Nager, and uh, a lot of things from the qual total quality management movement, quite frankly, from my exposure to all of that back in the early 80s. All right, so uh, let me move on here. Um, so when I look at performance, I tend to look at things at two different levels here, or uh, more levels than that. But when I look at performance, I create things that are called, uh, looking with a scope that I've been given, I carve out what are called, what I call areas of performance. Now, these are things could are called by various names, major duties, key results areas, even Gilbert's accomplishments. But what I found early on was that all those things have nuanced meanings to certain audiences. And so to avoid that, I said, I'm just gonna call my chunking areas of performance. And again, if my client likes a different label for that, well, I'll just change it because it's just a label. But the idea is to take the whole of performance and to segment it, much like marketing people segment target audiences. I segment performance into these areas of performance. And this is an example from the mid 80s that I did with a, a sales organization and for a sales rep, account rep. And for each one of those chunks then, those areas of performance, they get one or more performance model charts. And I, we'll be looking at this in a little bigger format here in just a second. But so that's how I, I first of all, established these area performance. It's like saying, well, what's instructional design? Now, you may or may not like the Addy model, but that's one way that people carve it all up. They go, hey, there's the A for analysis, then we do design, then we do development, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a similar kind of concept, than that framework or model. Um, so the when we look at the... Um, chunks of performance, these areas of performance, I start off by looking at, so on the left-hand side of that chart there, you know, what are the key outputs and how can you tell a good one from a bad one or what are the measures? And for every measure, we might look at what are the standards? Because if the measure was pounds, the standard might be 1.1 pounds plus or minus 10%, some range, some tolerance there. But uh, most places don't have a lot of standards for these outputs, because as I said earlier, most processes are informal. They're not named, they're not measured, they're not managed. And so when you get together and try to generate this kind of data, you begin to put things together that maybe people kind of knew, but didn't see, you know, in black and white in print. Um, when I generate this kind of information, I'm trying, usually working with a team of master performers. Uh, we used to call them subject matter experts. I used to call them subject matter experts back in the day, but I got burned by a subject matter expert that I worked with who was seven years out of the field and didn't know what was current. So I like what Tom Gilbert called exemplars, except my client at Motorola said they hated that word. It was a $3 college word, which makes it about a $30 word nowadays. Um, so I use the term master performers or whatever my client wants to call it. So if I get together uh, eight to 12 master performers and facilitate them to generate this kind of data, we segment the performance and then we detail it out, starting with beginning with the end in mind, what are the outputs of territory planning in this case? Well, it's a territory plan. And how do you know a good one from a bad one? What are the key measures? And I capture that. Now I've edited this, so the wording may not all make all that sense. I want you to get the general concept of this rather than look at the specific language that's captured on this chart here. But once I understand what the key outputs are, the worthy outputs that have to meet stakeholder requirements, which is what the measures should reflect, then I want to know what are the tasks. I've seen early in my career a lot of task analyses, and they could have been organized by the length of the word or sentence or alphabetically, but they didn't, they didn't tell me what was produced. And Gilbert warned us all in his book, Human Competence, about the cult of behaviors, which is basically tasks, the cult of tasks, where we are focused on tasks or behaviors, sans outputs. So we, if we're looking at behaviors and trying to help people learn new behaviors and we don't understand what the output is, we, you know, the behavior is only appropriate or not given the output that it produces. So I begin with these outputs and then I wanna understand what the tasks are and there's some columns in there for the various roles. I'm gonna admit that person in. Um, and uh, in this case, the salespeople are kind of like lone rangers that are out there doing their own thing on their own and nobody else is involved in territory planning, except in the subsequent pages of this thing here. But uh, so then I wanna look at what are the typical performance gaps? 
not the atypical happens every 47 and a half years, but just what's kind of typical. What are the typical problems that people have in mastering this thing called territory planning? And the, the group gave me a couple of these things here. And then I asked them, well, what's the probable gap cause? And I don't use root cause language because I don't have time to ask five uh, why, five times, why five times to get them to the supposed root cause for the gap. And uh, so, so I asked that, what's, what, so what do you think are the reasons people have these performance gaps? And they would tell me and I'd write it down and then I would ask them, so is, are these gaps here a deficiency of people's knowledge and skills, a DK? Are they a deficiency of environmental supports? Gilbert called DE's deficiency of uh, execution. I changed it. Um, or is it a deficiency of individual attributes and values? You can see the code at the bottom of that chart. Um, and then nowadays, I also include as a deficiency of the process, uh, which used to be folded into the environment. Uh, so this is how I walk people through articulating, capturing their articulation of what's this performance all about? Outputs, measures, tasks, typical gaps, probable gap causes, and what's that all about? So the left-hand side is basically ideal performance. If I've got a group of master performers who are all performing at a level of mastery the day before I met them, then I capture what they say. And then I ask them, so what about the people who aren't master performers? And um, what about them? What, what are the barriers or issues they're dealing with? And I get the performance gaps by taking a look at the measures. Where do the outputs not meet the measures? And I would rattle off to them, here are the measures you told me. So is this a typical problem? People don't meet that measure or they meet the first one, but they don't meet the second one. And that's how we generate the data on the right-hand side. Now, just because you can get a group of master performers to come to consensus on what's ideal performance and what's gap performance doesn't make them right. But who else would you ask? So I never felt that I could do observations, the Quality World calls it a Gemba walk, observe performance, see the overt behaviors, not see, seeing the uh, covert uh, uh, cognitive behaviors that people are using to perform. Um, and I think the research is clear that, you know, if you ask people what they're thinking about, they'll tell you, but it won't necessarily be right. Um, and that's a whole nother issue. But so, the data has its limits. It's not perfect, but it basically gives you a sense as to what the job is, what the performance requirements are, how the master performers look at this, and what the issues are for the non-master performers and what some of those causes might be. Now, I use this kind of data when I'm doing instruction because I got to teach people how to perform these tasks to produce these outputs, but now I can also inform them of what are the typical gaps that they might encounter. What are the barriers to their performance? What are the rocks and the roads? And how, based on the master performers and their strategies and tactics, how, do, how should they, the new people, avoid the barriers of performance in the first place? And if they were unavoidable, how to recover in the second place? So master performers have figured all of this out, how to avoid problems in the first place and what to do if they were unavoidable. And so that's the data that I'm trying to capture. All right, so back to this performance competence thing. It's all really about the stakeholder requirements. Now, stakeholders have requirements for outputs and tasks. Some stakeholders only care about the outputs. They don't care about the tasks. Others care about the tasks, but not the outputs. You know, some regulatory agencies concerned about child labor laws. They don't care what you produce, but they want to make sure you're not violating the law when you're doing that. So we can look at, I created, I had an article back in 95 about stakeholders. Uh, I had a client who, uh, Whose, whose performers were, were given conflicting stakeholder requirements and they didn't know how to reconcile that and how to figure out who, who wins, who doesn't. And so I created a model. And so there's a couple of ways to look at this. This is just for illustrative purposes here, but there's shareholders at the top and you can read the, the names of the other stakeholders are. Customers lead with their requirements, but they don't have final say. I mean, if the, if the customer wants you to do something and it's gonna bankroll the shareholders, the shareholders are not gonna allow you to do that. So it doesn't matter whether the customer wants that and demands that, we're not gonna do it. But we always wanna be listening to the customers because we've got to meet their needs as best we can. Uh, but anyway, so the whole thing about this is who sets the requirements for outputs and tasks. But here's another thing that the government actually overrides the concerns of the shareholders and owners. They've got 
laws, regulations, and codes that you must meet, or they'll fine you or throw you in jail or both. So it's not what the shareholders want exactly. There's a higher level of stakeholder involved in that. And then if we think about what the late Roger Kaufman taught us about mega and meeting societal needs, society and working for, you know, uh, the entire planet and all the people on it and all that stuff. And uh, although that doesn't have the same kind of sway normally that the government's laws and regulations, but we may be wanting to think about that too. So again, for illustrative purposes, uh, every organization has a hierarchy of stakeholders. Um, when they conflict, somebody's got to win, somebody's got to lose, and that's just the way it is. It's not always easy to explain to the people whose needs you're not going to meet why, but there's a reason for it. All right, so we're back to the fishbone portion of this performance competence, the ability to perform tasks and outputs to meet those stakeholder requirements depends on the processes we have, the environmental assets, and the human assets. So I can replace the whole performance competence thing with this performance model, because this is what we're trying to do. And do I have the people with the right things? And do I have the environment with the right things in order to enable all of that? So that's the focus when I'm looking at performance improvement beyond instruction, but including instruction. What are the gaps in these enablers that are causing issues with process performance? I use matrices to capture these enablers, and I'm not gonna cover the human asset enablers, I'm gonna cover the uh, environmental here, but for those of you looking at this on your smartphone, uh, this is the knowledge and skill matrices. This is the attributes and values. This is the data and information, materials and supplies, tools, equipment, uh, machinery, facilities and grounds, culture and consequences. So I can list what are all these enabler items, uh, budget and uh, headcount um, that are necessary to meet the process demands. So one example here is for a category of tools and equipment. Uh, made up an example here I'm going to use. And my, my framework here for my Addy like model on the left there, project planning and kickoff. If I was to systematically derive the enablers rather than just ask, you know, so what do you have to have? I need to go about this systematically. So I, so I feel more confident that I got the data that's accurate, complete, and appropriate. So I'm a kind of a, I, I need to do this systematically. So I might ask, so when you're doing the project and planning and kickoff thing, what tools and equipment do you need? I made up a name here, A, B, C, D, E, F, and I need it when I'm doing A, the phase one. So I can ask then when I'm doing analysis, what do I need? And I can list that and mark it appropriately for column B. Then design, I can ask for that and get that, the next one and that, and I can go through my whole model if I had performance model charts there with outputs and tasks and typical deficiencies, that stimulates the thinking of my master performers so that they think of when we're focused on this one category of tools and equipment and machinery, what do we need in order to enable that process? And so I walk through this kind of a approach, looking at my performance on the left over and over and over again as I, on the right, look at one category at a time and generate a list. And for those of you who know anything about scatter diagrams, you'll see that pattern in the link to areas of performance. If Guy came along and one of his people had generated this chart and this data, I would look at those linked areas of performance and I would look for a certain pattern to tell me that this was done systematically. But if those red X's were all over the place in, in some wild scattered pattern, I would know that my consultant had lost control of the meeting and just listed things that were being shouted out to them and that ain't no good in my view. So I'm looking for that kind of a pattern here. Now the other columns on the right there, you know, is, is the enabling item, A, B, C, D, E, F in the first row there, is that present satisfactorily or are we gonna have to address it? So P or A, how critical is it to the performance? Is it low or is it high? So there's high, medium, low, and there's actually also zero. Uh, how difficult is it to put this in place? How volatile is this item? Does it change all the time? Is this a software that's getting released every other week? And so it's a moving target. Uh, to what extent uh, do we have to put this in all the way 100 or 100 percent or some 80, 20, 20, 80 rule Pareto principle kind of a thing? 
So we just systematically derive the enablers and capture this other information about all of that. Questions? Yes, actually, we have quite a few. So one person said, why does your model put people at the top where Gilbert and other BEM folks um, put the environmental factors on the top? Um, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. It was arbitrary. You know, it's one of those things that if you feel more comfortable changing that around, uh, you know, please do it. I, I, I don't know. Excellent. And then the next question is, how often do you see SMEs who are also exemplars or accomplished performers? Um, well, the, the, so a subject matter expert, a SME, can be a master performer or an exemplar, can be. Um, but sometimes, you know, so when I do these meetings, uh, because I had gotten burned early on, I learned, I asked for top performers, master performers, people who are doing it this at a, at a level of mastery so we can help teach people to emulate them. That, that's the whole thing there. So, uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out, good stuff in, good stuff out. I need the top people here. And I tell my clients that if you give me an average performer, I'll give you an average product. If you give me top of the tier uh, players, then I'll give you a top tier product. Uh, but I, I won't know. I, it, it's not for me to decide who really are the top people. And we want to learn their there are strategies and tactics, and we want to train other people on that. But we also want to uncover what are some of the other issues that they know about, because my experience says that they do know about those. But we may need somebody from regulatory affairs, and the master performers know a little about, about regulatory affairs and how to avoid some of the dangers that violating the regulations may be. But maybe the regulations are changing, and the regulatory affairs people know what's coming down the pike and hasn't hit us yet. And so maybe we need somebody from regulatory affairs on our analysis team. So I need master performers and other subject matter experts, um, depending on the situation. So that's how I frame that, and I invite others in. Sometimes, you know, I get a vice president, uh, some regional sales vice president who insists that they want to sit on this thing too. Okay, they're not a master performer. And I won't pretend that they are, and maybe they will or won't pretend that they are, but they're not. But they have, they have, they're a stakeholder, so they have an expertise looking at things from a different perspective, and so they can be in there too. But when it comes down to tactically how to do something, what the micro tasks are, they probably don't know. Um, and so I just want to know who's who, who are the master performers. It's hard enough to get them to come to consensus on using language and things like that, because some people call it a tomato, some people call it a tomato, and you got to figure out, okay, that's the same darn thing. And, but, so you want these voices of the master performers and stakeholders in your process, and, and that's how I use that. Excellent. Uh, another question, and then we have one more after that. Would absence of consequence be a good gap cause? Yes, if there's, um, you know, you so um, I was talking to Stephanie Jackson a couple of weeks ago, who had worked with Harless and Toasty and some of the uh, old gurus from ISBI, NSBI days. And she was talking about how uh, Don Toasty had gotten into a fight with British Airways with another consultant there about whether or not you could measure culture. And Stephanie and Don would say, yeah, you can measure culture, you can count behaviors. So, so the, if, you, if you don't have uh, consequences in place, you can get whatever is expedient to the performer, whatever they think is best. And um, so perhaps it's not, but it could be an absence of consequences. There is a consequence there because there's no positive reinforcement, reward, um, or there's no punishment that it would extinguish certain behaviors. So if people are operating and doing the wrong thing, but there's no consequences for it, well, that is a consequence, uh, the absence of one. So, you know, if, if I, so I did a podcast uh, in January with Gary DePaul, another ISPIer, and uh, I used to tell people that when I hiring to my staff, my, my office manager would be uh, doing, doing through all the procedures, then they'd come in and meet me and I'd tell them, I'd chit chat with them and I'd say, okay, there's three ways to get fired here immediately. One of them is to engage in any racism. Another is to engage in any sexism. Another is to cheat my clients. Um, and I wanted them to know that uh, I would fire them on the spot and I expected my office manager to fire them on the spot if they violated any of those things here. There's no three strikes when it comes to those things. It was strike one and you're out. 
Um, and I wanted to be crystal clear on that because I had zero tolerance for those kinds of behaviors. Um, and so, so I wanted to make sure that there were consequences. Now, if I hadn't said anything like that and somebody had engaged in one of these inappropriate things and everybody let it slide, that reinforces that behavior that we didn't want. So I think consequences to Gary Rummler's point back in 1981 and subsequent to that is that the consequence system uh, is really a key to getting the right behaviors, you know, letting people know how they're performing, um, uh, you know, so it's the feedback and consequence thing that I think is really critical. Um, I, I believe that wholeheartedly. Thank you. And then the last question uh, is, uh, you, when you presented a grid, uh, someone wanted to know, what do you put in the roles and responsibility column? I, I either put in just X's or check marks to say, yeah, the, who's involved in task number two? You know, if I've got three or four or five columns with different job titles at the header of those columns, I'm checking who's involved. Or I could be more explicit. You know, there's a racy model, which I've never used because I never was really sure about the definitions of some of these things. But before that racy model uh, came out, uh, I used uh, ERISA. So people who execute the task, and the joke was, of course, if anything goes wrong, that's who we execute, ha ha ha. Uh, but uh, so we, who executes the task? They have the primary responsibility for doing the task. There's other people that support task performance, but it's not their job, but they support it. There's other people who give inputs to the task performance, but that's the limit of their role. There's other people who review task performance and can give feedback but that's all they can do is just give you feedback. They like it or they don't like it or whatever. There's other people who will approve and reject the task performance. That's the ultimate authority. So when the piece, person doing the execution of the task, they've got to appeal to that person who is the approval and rejection authority because they sit in judgment of that. So I can put in those letter codes there if that's necessary. Uh, a lot of times it takes a uh, longer to talk about that. And if you're really pressed for time, you ask for three days to do this kind of a meeting and the client gives you two, you don't have time to mess with that. You can at best just check who's involved with this and we'll figure out the specifics of the roles later on um, and defer that. Excellent, that's all we have for now. Oh, good. So I won't run out of time. All right, so how I structure the performance improvement effort. Uh, back to the enablers on the left, there they are. On the right is a chart I put together for Roger Addison uh, back in 2011. I can't remember what he was doing, but uh, he was doing the four W's there. You can see them in that chart. And I just came up with, here's a bunch of intervention types, if you will. There's overlap between them, but if we're working at the world level or the workplace level, that's different sometimes in the work level or the worker level. And, and so that was his intent here, but there's a lot of things and there's a lot of language for these things. And it's a kind of a mess for people, new people coming in trying to demystify all that stuff on the right. Um, and I guess this was my contribution to the mystification of it all. But um, so my uh, enterprise process improvement uh, model, EPI, targeting EPI is what I kind of branded this at, has two stages. And the first stage is modeled after my approach to instructional systems design, but it starts off with you know, project planning and kickoff. So we get everybody you know, on the project and make sure we're meeting everybody's needs and what everybody's perspectives are and understand who the stakeholders are and what's important and what they, how they see it and develop a project plan that says, here's how we're gonna go about doing that and getting them to sign off on it so that I get the right master performers, the right other subject matter experts, the right amount of time and to do this in a logical, rational way, but do it in a hurry guy. Yeah. So then phase two is analysis of the current state. So what are the ideal performance, whether that's a future state or a current state ideal, and what's the, what's the gaps? Um, and then we can go from there and, and there's little uh, upside down traffic lights, if you will, they're not stop lights, they're go lights, but that's where I would meet with the project steering team of the stakeholders and review everything with them and get their approval before I go into the next thing. So we call those meetings gate review meetings because they've got the gate, they can open the gate, let us through to go to the next phase or not. They can stop us, they can change our data, they can change whatever they want. After all, we're working for them. 
So we do that analysis of the current state and then we design the future state and we review that with them. And if they approve that or change that, then we deal with that. And then we go into implementation planning once we have an approved design of the future state. So we can figure out you know, what goes first, second, and third? How much is it going to cost? What are the resource requirements to do all that? And then again, meet with the project steering team for another gate review meeting before we go into stage two, which involves more micro project planning because we may have several work streams now that we have to plan in great detail. There was no sense in planning those in great detail until you got the blessing of the stakeholders, if you will, back in stage one. Um, then we go and do more micro analysis, and then we go do more micro design, and then we do more, this is an anti-like model, if you will. Uh, we do development and acquisition, you know, we build what we have to, we buy what we can, and we put that all together to build our, you know, build out what we're doing in our work stream, and then we go do a pilot test of some sort uh, to test it out before we release it to the world. And I, my little uh, gopher over there in the corner is saying the old one-two punch. Well, so stage one might lead to multiple stage two efforts, multiple work streams. And let me just go ahead to the next slide here. And so maintaining my phases, and of course, if you're working with some total quality management people or some other initiative and they got the lead, you're gonna have to take your Addy like model and reconfigure it. Now, some of you may be surprised that Addy is applied to something more than just instruction. And at NSPI, a long time ago, I learned that ADDIE is simply a project management, planning and management framework. And it's applicable to non-instructional interventions, if you will, as well as instructional interventions. And a lot of people think that ADDIE is somehow, you know, uniquely instructional in its nature. It's not. But anyway, so if you had several work streams and over here on the right, you can see that A is process redesign. This is a simplified example. Uh, B is SOP updates, so standard operating procedures, and then training is C. So if you imagine that this was a pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing process and uh, the regulators came in and, and said, we're gonna shut you down if you don't make these changes. And everybody saluted and said, we'll make the changes. So we may have to redesign the process. Then we're gonna have to update the standard operating procedures to reflect the new process. And then we're gonna have to train people on that new process before we let them make pharmaceuticals that could kill the customer. So ABC is uh, the macro project planning. We're gonna plan these three work streams and we're gonna time them all out so they're working in unison as best that we can. But too often I've seen where the analysis is done on different work streams separately. So I would put A, B and C together in one analysis effort and make sure you meet the needs for the process for design folks, the SOP folks, and the training or learning or whatever you call it, learning experience folks. And then let them go off and do their design for their product or services or whatever it's gonna be. And then we get together and we integrate it and see how well it's gonna work when we integrate the whole things together or there are some disconnections that we need to fix. Then we go, and you know, it's a paper exercise if you will, looking at designs. Then we go into, excuse me, uh, development and then we go into development, integration, and testing to make sure that works. And we do a full-blown pilot. And to me, a pilot is as authentic as it possibly can be. It may be the first installation or the first delivery or whatever, and you're just paying particular attention to it than the 47th uh, delivery of something. But so the pilot test is done. It's done under as, as authentic uh, conditions as you possibly can. And then you go into revision or release. You may have to tweak something before you release it on the, on the world and make it generally available. That's kind of manufacturing terms. So this is an example where there's just three work streams. Of course, in the real world, if you're really doing performance improvement, you may have many more than just three work streams that have to all come together and work correctly. And while the graphic may suggest that we're releasing everything all at the same time, it may be that things have to be in, uh, released in staged approaches. So you're the timing of the activities of each work stream may not line up like they do in this graphic. So don't let that fool you. Final questions before we uh, talk about some of the resources that I have on this. No questions right now. Okay. So uh, this is not that important, but I see my instructional systems design methodology set packed 
uh, as a subset of EPI, my performance improvement methodology set. And I created the packed processes first, but I had in mind my eventual expansion into performance improvement. And to me, the key players, uh, the hats that are worn in instructional design that would need to broaden out in the future included the project planners and managers of instructional projects would need to expand and understand the implications of looking beyond instruction. And the analyst role is critical in looking beyond just the knowledge and skill requirements for a process. They need to look at all those other enablers, all those other variables. And But my instructional designer probably didn't have a role to play in growing into the uh, in performance improvement world or my developers and et cetera, my instructors, if that was gonna be an instruct, instructor-led training kind of a thing. Um, but those two roles, project planning and managers, we're gonna have to be cognizant of what the differences are between doing an instructional design project and doing a performance improvement project. And my, in, my analysts in an instructional design project, whether the project was for performance improvement from the get-go or was simply for an instructional design intervention, I needed them to be on the lookout for all those variables when they did their performance analysis and the gap analysis, to be on the lookout for all of the variables that were of issue that were inhibiting ideal performance. Because we may still be doing the instructional thing downstream from that point on, but we needed to help our client understand this is what's going on here. There's these other things that you may need to fix, may want to fix before you get to delivering training because training is not going to solve your problems. Now, many times our clients don't have the resources to make all the fixes necessary to make it an ideal world for the performers. So the next best thing is at least to warn the performers, the new people coming in, being trained to perform in the processes. We need to tell them what those barriers are that they may face, how to avoid them in the first place, and what to do in the second place if they were unavoidable. And nobody knows that better, maybe not ideally, maybe not perfectly, but nobody knows that better than the current state master performers. And we need to tap into they, what they know, which is not always necessary because a lot of this is non-conscious knowledge. They just internalized it, it's, they're automated. And, but we need to tap into, think, into what they know, maybe through cognitive task analysis and there's other methods, um, so that we can share that with the new people. So we can help them avoid some of the pitfalls, the barriers to performance that, that, that they might be able to recognize and to include that in our instruction. So this, we're not teaching them it's as easy as one, two, three. It may be one, two, three, but when you're doing two, watch out for this, watch out for that. And if it was unavoidable and you get caught up by that, here's how you're gonna recover and recover quickly and minimize the damage that it's done. Anyway, that's the kind of the basis for all of this. Um, in the third edition of the uh, HPT handbook, as it's sometimes called, I've got, uh, I did chapter 11, modeling mastery performance and systematically deriving the enablers for performance improvement. Um, it, was, it wasn't a sexy title, was it? But anyway, there's a free 25 page PDF on that on my website. I got a boatload of uh, videos for free on my YouTube channel. You can go back and look at all this later on. What did I do during the pandemic? I wrote my 15th book, um, Conducting Performance-Based Instructional Analysis, basically in every phase of an instructional systems design effort, the ADDIE model. I do, I do analysis in all those phases. I don't do it all up front in one fell swoop, uh, which then often feels like analysis paralysis to my clients. I defer what I, don't, what I need until I need it. Uh, I have a book from 2011 on doing this, uh, training to performance improvement consulting. So a lot of details are in there. It's a book from 2011, as I said. This is really all about performance competence, the ability to perform tasks, to produce outputs, to stakeholder requirements. Sometimes that involves instruction. Sometimes it involves other areas, other enablers, other intervention types. And so that was my intent to share all of that with you today. This is my company. 
Um, thank you for your time today. If you have any questions that we don't get to here or they come to you later on, email me. I'm happy to chat with you all about this.